obviously with the light of the two games go ahead, obviously it was really um, obviously sad news at the weekend. I think it gripped the nation, didn't it? And I think uh, we, we wasn't expecting the games to go on. So whoever's been behind uh, the policing and the organisation between obviously ourselves and Millwall and ourselves and Stoke to get these games on, it's really appreciated because um, although it was a sad weekend, obviously everyone involved in football, we didn't really know what to do with ourselves. Uh, at the weekend in terms of but obviously really sad news and um, and yeah I'm sure that the respects paid around the stadiums are going to be magnificent this week to see I thought it was fantastic to see at the Oval with the England and the um, the cricket team out that came and uh, and so yeah I, I think we're going to see some amazing scenes midweek and at the weekend around the country which is fantastic. How much of a sort of disruption was the game not being on on Saturday in terms of I guess you, you order your training, you kind of taper for match days. What did you end up doing on the Saturday? Were the boys in just training or did you give them the day off? Or, what, we did... trained extremely hard on Friday, you know, like really hard because we were waited. We delayed the session because I had a feeling that I wanted to know, because it's difficult for players, there's certain meetings that happen on a Friday, obviously team meetings and stuff like that. And then your Friday session is your lowest one before the game. So we pushed our training back and we waited to uh, to hear whether the game was on or off. And just literally, just before we went out to train, we heard the news that the game was off, which meant we could change the training session. I had like two session plans written out, one if the game was on and one if the game was off. When the game was off, we went out and it was hugely competitive. So we were talking about 7v7 on a full-size pitch and stuff like that. So it was a, a really physical session and a, and a good and a really good day. Saturday felt strange because I like Saturday's off and there's no other football. It felt like a Sunday or an off season. I didn't know what to do. And I got dragged to watch the 40 year anniversary of ET at cinema with the family. So it was a nice day out. But and then I came in here on Sunday and I was like, wow, like I didn't know what day of the week it was. It was kind of strange. I'm sure it was like that for everybody over the weekend because you're watching the news and you're watching all them, you know all the emotion coming out and you know you're seeing something that you'll remember for the rest of your life you know you're seeing a, a queen pass away and then a king be sort of um be sort of crowned in front of your eyes you know things you've not really i've not seen before so it, it was it, it was appealed to the news over the weekend and but it was nice to have a bit of family time we were in sunday um and then Monday, Tuesday, building into the game. When we got the news yesterday, the game was on. There was a real buzz around the building because it, there, there was a lot of uncertainty. It's only sort of um, in the COVID time, we sometimes didn't know whether games were on or off, you know, within 24 or 48 hours. And it was quite disruptive in terms of your training. And I think people don't realise it's not your physical training, it's your mental preparation that it can knock a lot. Do you know what I mean? And I was... Um, I was going to pick a certain team on Saturday, which meant on Friday, if I'd have told one or two they weren't playing before the game was called off, I'd have probably created a few problems for myself. So I did some delaying tactics here until I found out and it saved me having a couple of awkward conversations, which in my job, you know you've got to do them, but sometimes you can avoid them. It's nice, mate. Yeah. And, and just have you been given any sort of indication when that game will be replayed? Because I'm just sort of looking at October. It's a pretty brutal run of fixtures you've got and sort of and then it's the World Cup and the short in November and the clubs are still talking but I think it might it might be at the start of the next month if you were looking for a guest um, I can't obviously speak about the date here because it's not been finalised but we've been in discussions with Huddersfield they're scheduled they've got a couple of Sunday games or at least one which sort of wipes out one midweek um, so it will be in maybe that that first ten or twelve days of November before the World Cup. That's where we would, with both teams, are sort of aiming. But obviously, nothing's been confirmed as yet. Uh, we were obviously looking at maybe having two or three games to, to to reschedule, which would have obviously put. I wasn't too concerned with that because I think the longer we are together and the more everyone's fit, the stronger QPR are going to get. That's my aim for the season for us to get stronger as we travel along. Um, so, yeah, I think that game will go in just before the World Cup. That's the plan at the moment. Uh, and as you said, you alluded to just, just a minute ago about, you know, conversation with players. I mean, as you say, you've got most players fit now and you've only got a certain amount of places you can fill in the squad. I mean, how do you sort of deal with the players that aren't involved? Is that sort of something well, I've you're working on or something you... 
I've always been honest with the players, Ian. Like, you know, before the window shut, there was a lot of honest conversations around, you know, uh, you, you know, your position in the squad. And I was happy to to have players here as long as they were happy with their lot. You know, they no one's guaranteed anything. You've got to fight it out in training. I've been honest about that since I come in. Um, you know, you've got to be someone that you've got talent, but I want your talent to make the team better in and out of possession all the time. I also want to play an intensity that some players had never seen before and are still finding time to adapt to that intensity that I want to play at. So therefore, with five subs, I'm sort of saying, well, look, you've got to give me your best, what, what your best looks like for, for a certain amount of time. And then I'm relying on the strength of the squad uh, from the bench. So it is difficult at times, but I find that honesty is the best, the best policy in that. Do you know what I mean? And um We've got a 25 player squad and, and we've got one or two young players training us from the academy at the minute that I'm quite keen on as well, getting opportunity. So they've got to fight it out. And uh, we had that conversation when I first joined about the strongest team playing and the strongest team training against the others. So sometimes in training, you've got to get in the strongest team as well. Like I believe that if you're going to make strong relationships on the pitch, you have to train next to each other every single day. So if that's a centre-half pairing or centre midfield free or a full-back and wide player or free forwards, you have you, you, no point splitting them up to make the teams even. This is not the school playground. This is an, you know, an elite environment we're trying to create. And there is a pecking order and you've got to fight. You know, I think when you're a young player, sometimes you fail to realise that you sign a contract that guarantees training. So what I always guarantee the players is that we'll give them the same amount of opportunity in training. They've all got like a unit coach that works for them individually. They get the same, but you know, that's the only guarantee you have the training. You're not guaranteed to play. That's what a manager or a head coach is selected to do. So I think sometimes young players fail to understand that, that the contract they sign is for training. It's, it, that's the only thing it guarantees. So you have to train well to play and, they're the sort of things that I'm trying to embed here uh, over time. And does that work with the loan players as well? I mean, obviously you hear stories about Premier League loaning players to championship clubs and they're demanding they have to play all the time. Is that is that an urban myth or is that sort of, is that true? No, there's certain clubs that do do it, but then you get a choice. There's other players that are at another time where, you know, physically three games in a week for, for a player coming on loan, he might have had a prior injury. So I think these the goalposts move. That's quite a nice football saying that. It's my favourite one, actually, the goalposts move. Like, you know, nothing's fixed. Um, and in terms of our negotiations with, with loan clubs, we're sort of bringing players in here that are hungry to improve and develop. And part of developing is taking feedback when maybe you're not playing well and understanding that you've got to earn the right to play. The clubs that we spoke to in the summer that have loaned us their players um, have all bought into that. So I think that there is cases, I've worked in clubs where we've sent players on loans and there's big penalties if you don't play. Um, but you factor all that in. And ultimately, I'm not in the job of putting someone on the pitch just because we might have to pay something. And that was part of our negotiations with the clubs that we've, we've loaned players from, that that wouldn't be in there. You know, that we, they're coming on loan to a coach that's worked in development for over 20 years and is, is, is really known for helping young players improve and develop onwards. And that, that my judgment on their development, along with liaising with them clubs, would be sufficient. So uh, them, them things are out there, but they're not out there in the agreements that we have. Okay. And just finally, you mentioned that Harry Watlin as well, the set piece coach. I mean, obviously, you know what you're going to get from Mill tomorrow night. Um, how, does his, how does that generally, I mean, I guess when there's games every two days, he's, the chance for him to do what he wants to do is sort of limited. But I'm, I'm guessing the break you've had since the last week just allowed him to kind of maybe do more. Is that is that right? Yeah. Um, Harry's from that part of the world. Can let out a secret. That's the club that he followed as a young boy as well. So he's uh, he's well versed on them. Like he's like an opposition analysis this week. He knows them well. Harry's come in. It's not the only job he does. He works uh, closely with Neil and the defenders and spends a lot of time with the fullbacks as well. Uh, I think it's all in moderation. I don't think you're going to spend eighty percent of your week on set plays. You know, like you know, you don't spend eighty percent of your week on defending. There's that healthy mix of practices that that keep it relevant. We throw them in at different times in certain games in training we do it in isolation we let the free kick takers go off and work on their delivery we let the center backs and the markers go away and do their work and we bring it all together 
in the two game in the two days prior to each game. If we're not making many changes to our eleven, um, it gives us a lot of clarity in some other areas. I.e., if we're not making changes to the eleven, we're going to defend a certain way and we're going to attack a certain way, regardless of the opponent. Therefore, Harry can spend a bit more time on the set of plays because when there's a lot of changes in the team, that's where the issues arise. You know, so if the changes at centre back or changes in goalkeeper or in profile of players, if you look was to lose a Sam Field and uh, Lyndon Dykes, for example, and replace them with Andre Dazelle and Amide Shadipo, your height and your profile changes. Um, so then they're the things that set play coaches have got to be aware of. But throw-ins are really important um, as well. And just restarts in terms of free kicks in the middle of the pitch. It's a bigger job than just attacking and defending corners and free kicks. So he's doing a really, really good job. And um, as I say, like whether you're, you're an amateur team or whether you're the best team in the world, the Champions League winning team, set plays are a little bit of a leveller, you know. You know, you've got to have someone who delivers a good ball and you've got to have people in the middle that want to go and attack it. And I think that any level of football, you can be very good at set plays uh, and you can constantly improve. Obviously, it's more difficult to play like a Real Madrid if you don't have that type of players between the two boxes. But on set plays, it's becoming, or it always has been a very important part of the game because goals change momentum, don't they? So we can see the goal at home to Rotherham from a set play. And then we have all the game after that, score a magnificent goal. And we can't find the second goal. That's a game we'll always look back on this season, kicking ourselves that we should have we should have took two more points. So set plays that day stole two points from us, really.